All right, who is excited to draw with me today? I'm Scott with Artist Network. Um, I'm just starting this drawing today. It's a line drawing, uh, working on a landscape. Now, if you uh, had, if you've been watching the, if you had time to read the uh, description there, you'll see a reference photo in there that you can open and download. Uh, this is a subject that I'm working on today. Um, it is a, a, a photo that I took um, from a, one of my favorite spots here in Fort Collins. Um, and I uh, have decided that I'm going to do a line drawing. So in the previous live demonstration, I did a lot of value control, working with edges, um, controlling kind of subtle shifts in light and dark. And I talked a bit about edges and line work, and that's really what I want to explore here. So if you're ready to join me, um, all you really need is a pencil and an eraser and a piece of paper. I have uh, an ebony pencil. I also have a charcoal pencil that I'll be working with today. Um, you don't necessarily need to have them, uh, but if you do, it can kind of give you a bit more kind of control over your, um, over your drawing. So I'm going to set my reference image up there, and I'd, I'd like to just get started here. Um, one, of the, one of the things that I'm really going for in this assignment, and why I, I chose to, um, and I call it an assignment because I'm, I'm really assigning it to myself, um, is I'm giving myself the challenge of creating depth using only line. Um, and if you are new to drawing, that may not make a whole lot of sense at this point, but um, really what a, what a line is, is it's, a, it's an abstract symbol for an edge. If, if you actually look throughout nature, um, lines as we conceive of them in a drawing don't really exist. Um, we've, I, we've, we kind of naturally have that, that ability. It's kind of something that's born into us to use a line to represent the edge of an object. Um, and that's really what this, um, what this is all about. I took this photo and you can kind of see in the reference in the lower left that um, it, it's a nice spot. I, I love this spot. The light in it's not really ideal for painting and, and it's because it's really washed out that um, at the time of day I was driving by, um, the sun was just blasting that whole valley and it wasn't creating a whole lot of variation in terms of lights and darks. Um, what I really was responding to in that moment though were these lines. I can pull down the reference photo here with the lines uh, in the landscape that were naturally forming. You know, I love the contrast of these kind of fluid lines here in the foreground that are even cut across with these subtle tire marks. Um, and you, we have these roads cutting diagonally across. We have fence lines. There are a lot of uh, lines that really break up the plane of that, um, of that landscape. And then that gets contrasted by these really soft areas of these, uh, these kind of forested areas, these trees here, these groups of trees. And then you go even farther back and you've got the mountains where you have these really nice kind of uh, wave-like lines that form the, the horizon back there. Um, and then with these structures uh, scattered throughout, they provide some nice um, areas, a focal point for us. You know, we can rest our eyes in each of these points here. Um, and with these sharp edges, they really kind of stand out in that landscape. So they provide structure and form to that landscape and they contrast nicely to all of these fluid elements. And so that's really what I'm um, looking to capture here. Um, so in the previous drawing, I, I spent a lot of time focusing on value relationships. Because this reference photo doesn't have a strong contrast in terms of value, I am uh, really just going to use this as a, as a way to explore a line. Um, the the, the benefit to working with line is uh, there's, there's two main things that I'm looking for. One is that it's a really helpful way for me to, to focus on, um, on proportion control. And, and, and secondly, it's about concentration. And one of the things we talk a lot about um, here at Artist Network is, is the, the act of making art. Um, kind of the, the, the mindfulness that's um, kind of inherent in that process. The idea that when you're creating a work of art, whether it's drawing or painting, um, even if you're sculpting or if you're mixing media, you're doing all sorts of fun things, um, that act in itself is 
a, a way to kind of focus your mind, bring you into the present moment. It's something I think about a lot here, um, and not uh, just when I'm drawing, but when I'm, I'm painting as well. Um, and with this line work, and by focusing just on line, and we have all of this detail in the drawing, I mean, there's a lot going on in here, uh, from you know the building in the foreground to all these really organic shapes with the trees, um, alternating between structure and organic, uh, back into structure, more organic material. There's so much going on in there that um, I need to be really concentrating on what I'm looking at, taking my time and thinking through it clearly. So what I'm doing at this point is I'm starting to just lock in on some of the major shapes that I'm responding to. I've indicated the center of the page roughly. I didn't use a, a ruler to measure this out, but I indicated the center and that's going to help me to um, control the proportions just a little bit. Um, and so if I, if for example, if I'm, if I'm looking here, the rough center is right around in here, just to the, the right of this barn. Um, knowing that, um, if I can place that on my paper, I can start to measure out from that. I can see where the silo goes. That's a landmark for me. I can see where this is relative to that center and how much distance there is between that center and the, the, the first edge of the building and then from the, the left edge of the building to the edge of the paper. Um, now, you may have noticed that the paper I'm working on is um, largely horizontal. I've trimmed it down. So the dimensions I'm working here are at seven and a half tall by uh, 14 wide. So I took an 11 by 14 sheet of paper, kind of a standard sheet, and I cut it down. And that's something I'd really encourage for all of you. Um, we tend to get locked into the dimensions that we are given when we buy a, a pad of paper. Um, and it can be quite freeing to start to um, kind of break from that. So I'd encourage you to, uh, if you're not doing it for this drawing, for at least a, for, for future work, really play around with dimensions and see what it does to, um, to your work. In this case, I really like the, the horizontal nature of the, uh, the landscape here. I didn't feel like crop, cropping it down any farther. Um, and so I'm, I'm letting it really be horizontal here. Uh, now, as I'm drawing, I'm constantly looking. I'm looking back very quickly, back and forth between my drawing and the reference photo. And so if, if you have the reference photo in front of you as well, you kind of do the same. Um, one of the things I talked about in the previous, um, in the previous uh, the drawing was the idea that uh, you kind of want to split your attention between what is happening um, in your subject and what's on the paper. You're kind of looking at both at the same time, and so that's what I'm doing here. Um, now, if, if you're following along uh, and you have any comments, um, if you have any questions for me, I'm going to be monitoring the feed here, so you're, um, you know, go ahead and, and follow along and uh, post any of your, your questions. I'm going to take, take some time later on to address them, um, but if, if some of what I'm saying is not working for you, if it's not making a whole lot of sense, then let me know. So uh, the uh, what I'm doing now is I'm starting to just kind of lay in the forms, knowing that I'm going to continue to adjust them as I go. Uh, now you're going to notice I'm holding my pencil very far back. Um, I'm just letting the um, the weight of the pencil make the marks itself. So what you're seeing on the page is very light. I'm going to be coming back in later with my charcoal to create some um, darker marks. Um, and what I'm doing now is I want to, this is kind of a, a high focal point area in here. So I'm going to take a little bit of time to lock this in. Um, actually, I'm going to, if I place my center there, I need to bring this over, this is that, just the roof that we're seeing with the barn. Um, placing, so just some vertical marks, some horizontal marks, um, and it may not look like a whole lot at this point, um, but in my mind I'm thinking about these structures in here. Um, and as I'm doing that, I'm moving from point to point. So if I'm here, 
on the, the roof line of this barn here, I'm going to look over and the base of the silo forms just to the uh, kind of lower left of that, that point right there. Um, the base is above the base here. So I'm looking to kind of triangulate these portion, uh, these objects here. Um, looking at some of this negative space, that's the space around um, and between these objects. And you're going to see uh, here, I'm extending these lines. I'm not um, stopping right at the right point. I'm just trying to find out what that angle is for the roof line. And then I'm going to place the edges where I feel like they need to go. So if I'm placing the right edge of this barn, I'm looking at it in relationship to the silo here. And that means this angle comes in a little bit. So constantly adjusting. Uh, remember, like I said in the last drawing, it's kind of like drawing in sand. Um, you want to think about your marks as being fluid and flexible. You're moving them constantly throughout the whole process. You're never getting the angle or the line right the first time, or you're never trusting that you're getting it right the first time, um, and you're always coming back and checking it again. So kind of locking down these proportions, I'm feeling pretty good at it. I'm looking at the distances between these objects here. Um, as I'm looking at the, this barn down here, I'm going to compare it to what I see above here, and you can see that I have the left edge in line with the left edge of this barn up here. So I need to move this over. And that's going to come over here. So now I'm moving this whole barn over. Again, looking at constantly comparing where I am right now with everything else that's happening in the drawing. Moving out a little bit. Just kind of light sketch marks to indicate this, this front, uh, this kind of hillside that drops down into the valley. And so here, for example, I've got this kind of the low point in this this dip right here and I've got it below the the barn and I feel like that's probably too low so I can bring that up let's see just kind of some rough marks in here to indicate where these trees are uh, looking at this tree as a, as a landmark, I will erase out some of the marks so I don't confuse where I am. And again, that may be incorrect right now, but I'm going to put it there for now. So this big tree here becomes a landmark. I like the way it transitions between this front barn um, and this back one here. It's just off to the left of this edge here. Um, and it's directly below the left side of this barn here. So that creates this path that I can check against my own drawing and feel like I'm, I'm pretty darn close. I'm going to make some adjustments later on, but um, I think I've got myself in the ballpark. It's kind of some rough sketching as I'm just thinking about you know, some of these forms here. One of the things I, I say to my students a lot, um, and it's really kind of key for me as an artist, is this idea that marks are thoughts. That as you're drawing, as you're making marks, each mark you make represents a thought uh, about the subject. It's something that's in your mind that you're getting out there onto the paper. Um, and if the mark is not doing what you want it to do, and the first place to look is you're thinking about it. What are you thinking about when you're making those marks? Um, are you um, distracted by something? Are you really kind of immersed in the drawing process, in the subject? Are you fascinated by the mark itself? Or are you thinking about uh, the subject, what you're drawing? And it's not to say that any one thing is better than the other, but it's important to start to pay attention to those things. Um, and the more you do, the the, the greater clarity you're going to have 
um, throughout the entire art making process. So, so take some time to think when, you, when you've made a mark, look at it and say, what, what did I just do there? Was I thinking? Was I thinking about something else? Um, was it something that I had control over? Do I need to look at it again? So you can see that I'm, I'm up here in this, this background hill and I kind of had originally drawn it too large. So I'm just kind of mapping out some of the main features of this landscape. Um, moving my way back up to the, the, the distant kind of foothills here. Um, so as I'm looking at these, this, this becomes a landmark for me, this fence line. And now in the photo, it's very, very subtle. Um, but it becomes a prominent point for me that I'm using as a reference point as I start to place everything else. Um, so I, I want to get that angle pretty close to accurate. I, um, and I'm going to use that. I'm going to measure up from there and see what is directly above it. Um, and there's another landmark uh, right here. This is called Gray Rock. That's the name of the of the, that mountain there. Um, and that's just off to the right of that vertical edge. So if I bring a line straight up, a plumb line, move off to the right, that's where I can place gray rock. And I'm just kind of moving my way across. Now I'm going to find another landmark. I'm going to use the silo as one. Now it's not quite correct in its proportions, but I feel like the placement is pretty close. So I'm going to go up from there, see where it gets me um, in terms of that, that mountain ridge line, what mountain am I looking at? And now I have these two points. I've got gray rock and I've got this point here. And that's looking at it at this, um, this mountain point right here. Um, if I have those two placed, then I have a field in here that I need to place all the other mountains in there. Um, but that gives me kind of a playing field to work within. and uh, kind of some landmarks to, to work with. So I'm gonna look down here as I'm placing those mountains and looking at the shapes of them, I'm looking at them in relationship to some of the other landmarks I've established. Now moving down in the, into that, that space in between is the base of these foothills. I'm going to keep making adjustments. Now you see it, I'm not erasing a whole lot at this point. Um, so the, let me see, I wonder if I have the chat enabled here. Yeah, live chat is enabled. So I just want to make sure of that. So um, again, if you have any questions, if you're following along, Looks like there's some kind of an issue with the chat right now. It's unable to connect. Um, I'm going to keep trying. Something seems to be happening with YouTube. Um, I'm going to uh, keep monitoring that, but if you do have any questions, let's see if we can get that chat to work. Um, could be just something that's that YouTube is going through. Like a lot of people are taking some time to. Uh, to watch uh, whatever's happening out there. Okay, so I feel like I'm in pretty good shape with establishing my basic landmarks here. Uh, haven't done a whole lot in that foreground. You can see that I'm starting to smudge along here. That's fine too. I'm not gonna be uh, too precious with, um, with my marks at this point. Everything is going to adjust. So you can see that I basically started from the center and I worked my way out. Now that I've got everything mapped pretty closely to the, what I want. I've got the major shapes established and I've got my landmarks in there. I've got these structures. Uh, now I can start to refine. Um, now, one of the challenges to this, um, it, it, working with line is that um, I wanna try to create a sense of depth here. If I use the same weight of line throughout the entire drawing, it's gonna flatten it out. So I wanna use line to help me create more depth. Uh, and the tools I have available are line weight um, and the 
uh, and the pressure that I have, at which I, you know, play in placing that. So if I, by, by holding my pencil like this, it allows me to kind of lean into the tip. Now I'm not engaging the tip directly. I'm not pointing it down. I'm still holding it on its side, which allows it to scrape across the surface. Um, and it allows me greater uh, pressure control. So I can make the line thick, I can make it thin, I can also push down hard on it to make it darker, and I can lift up to make it lighter. And I want to use all of those tools throughout the drawing to create as much depth as I can. Um, now, if the goal was to really create depth, um, if I were to create a finished painting on this, then I'd have color that I could use at a value. I have all of these other um, elements of art that I can use to create depth. But I've restricted myself to using only line, and I'm going to see how far I can push that. I want to see, can I make a... Um, a space in this drawing that makes it feel like you can walk into it using only line weight. Um, so I'm going to start by continuing to use you know this ebony pencil. This is a very soft pencil. It gives me a full range of values. So if you're using just a regular number two pencil, like a, a yellow kind of school pencil, um, you can get something very similar with that. You don't need um, a, a full set of pencils. If you do, if you have a full set of artist pencils, um, then what you'll find is that they have available to you a wide range of, of, of hardnesses and softness. So um, you're going to have your H's, which are very hard. You have your B's, which are very soft, and they have the little codes on them. Um, if I look at my uh, charcoal pencil, it's got a 2B on there. So my, my charcoal pencil is a 2B. It's relatively soft. Um, if you're using your kind of more kind of professional grade uh, uh, graphite pencils, you can use a, a, a lighter pencil, like a 4H or something in the background, and start to transition as you move forward into heavier um, pencils, maybe up to the 4B or a 6B in the foreground. Um, I prefer just to have one pencil that I'm using. I don't like to switch back and forth, but that's gonna be up to you if you're following along. So um, what I wanna do is I just wanna keep my marks light and loose at this point. Um, kind of tap along here to kind of pull up some of that. This is my kneaded eraser. And I'm gonna go through and refine these drawings. So now that I have all these major shapes established, I'm not thinking about where I'm placing my marks as much as I was before. Now this is about really looking at that form. And I can see I need to make some corrections there, but maybe I'll come back to that later. So I'm looking back and forth very quickly between my drawing and my, uh, my reference photo here. Um, now, one of the things I like to do is I like to think about these lines as kind of skipping across the page. Rather than one solid heavy mark throughout there, I'm letting that, that that, uh, that, that tip just kind of skip and jump across the, the surface there. I'm gonna come up here with the gray rock. Uh, now almost like these are like a connect the dots, uh, you know, something, uh, or like a constellation, something like that. Um, there's a, a principle um, in design theory and gestalt theory that, um, that describes that and it's called the, the law of good continuation. It's the idea that in our mind that our brain is really good at looking at um, a, a series of marks and piecing them together into some recognizable shape. So we look up at the stars, we see a cluster of, of marks or dots, and we, in our minds, turn that into something. Uh, and that's a tool that we can use to our advantage when we're drawing. Um, and so it, it makes the line more lively um, and more kind of engaging for the mind because then the viewer is forced to kind of piece together that as well. Their brain is active putting together all these dots into some sort of recognizable image. And so you've got viewers already working with you to create an image. And now, if, if, you, if you look at the reference photo, as I was talking earlier about the nature of edges and line, there's no line that represents that edge. It's just a change in value between dark and light, or in some areas it's lighter where the snow is against the sky that's a little bit darker. In some areas we can barely even see it, so gray rock is hardly visible at all. 
Um, so what we're doing here with our lines is we're, we're actually creating an abstract symbol for an edge. And I like to think about what our marks mean. What does that line really represent? Again, going back to the idea that marks are thoughts, you can be having a thought about the subject that you're um, that you're working from. So I'm thinking about, you know, what is it? Is it a tree? Is it a hillside? Is it a pasture? Am I drawing a, a tree that's far away? Is it a tree that's close to me? And I can use my marks to reference what that is. So maybe I'll use um, kind of softer, more organic marks and some of these hillsides, um, maybe a slightly different mark for some of these trees. And then as I get closer to the buildings, I start to work with those roof lines, and then maybe those will be harder and sharper to contrast against some of the more organic marks throughout the, uh, the rest of the drawing. Um, so kind of getting back to that idea of concentration, now what I'm doing, again, because I have my major areas mapped out, I'm just going from piece to piece in the drawing, indicating my marks constantly looking back and forth to make sure I'm still working in the right area, looking for landmarks, looking to see that those landmarks are placed properly. So here's like a larger tree in that kind of back pasture. I can place that there. Now one of the nice things about this easel that I've got, um, it's got this horizontal bar at the base that I'm resting my arm against. Um, and I can use that as a guide. I can slide my arm left and right along that and give myself a fairly um, controlled and horizontal mark when I need it. Now, if you look at my hand, I'm not moving my wrist at all, really. I've got my pencil kind of locked down um, in a, this tripod grip. Um, I've moved it up the base from what I had it earlier. That's giving me greater control. And I'm just moving my arm left and right kind of moving throughout, throughout the drawing. And really just thinking about tapping uh, these objects in there. And then I have to ask myself, how important is it that these proportions are 100% accurate? Because I know they're off right now, just even if they're slightly, they're off and I can continue to adjust them. But before I do that, I actually want to work through the entire drawing and then continue to adjust because there may be some information that comes to me as I'm working that I'm going to need to know later on. So, okay, so I'm back in here. There's this kind of line here, of trees just on the other side of this road. that subtle fence line. And so with line, because like I said, marks are thoughts, this is a great opportunity for you to choose what is important to you in the landscape. As I mentioned earlier, this line along here, even though it's not very visible in the photo, it's something that really jumps out at me and I'm going to probably overstate it. I'm gonna make it more present in the drawing than it actually is in the reference photo. And if I was, um, in the landscape, I was working on plein air, I would probably end up doing the same thing. I would probably overstate it to some degree. And, and so then you as the artist, you get to control that threshold for what is correct and what, how, you know, what do you need to reference? Um, do you want it to be something that really indicates where your mind was at, or do you want it to be optically correct and have it placed exactly where you want it to be? or where it is in the landscape. Um, so, and sometimes they kind of jump back and forth, but those are some of the things that you want to be thinking about as you go. So I started to put in these kind of darker clusters of trees, kind of work my way down now to this area here, and I'm going to continue to adjust that as we go. Um, now, you notice I'm not pulling out a ruler at this point to create straight edges. Now, it's something you could do. Um, but I prefer not to. So this is getting really kind of confused in here. So I'm gonna use my eraser to kind of cut back and find some of those lines again. And 
Now, one of the, the reasons I generally suggest against using a ruler is that it's not, it creates marks that are not natural to the way we look. Um, when we're looking at something, our eyes are darting around all the time, and it's very un uncommon for us to perceive a hard and straight edge. We're kind of moving around from one spot to the next, and in our mind, that's breaking up those edges. Um, you know, we're looking at a little bit, bit here, we're looking at another bit over here. Um, we're never seeing it as one, any, any line as one solid, continuous thing. Um, and, and so I feel like there's something that happens in the brain when we make a drawing that replicates that experience where we have lines that are broken. It feels more naturalistic because that's what we would be doing. We're looking at a little piece here, then we're jumping around to another part of the drawing. All right, so kind of move my way through. I don't want to get too far into the foreground here. So I want to kind of give myself a few more indicators along here, maybe place uh, some of these telephone poles. Now, one of the things that's nice is that, you know, as I'm placing the, if I, as I look at the barn here and I'm placing this telephone pole to the left of it, that feels consistent with the, with the, the space between those two in the reference photo. And if I look up where it is underneath this kind of dark grouping of trees, I feel like I'm in pretty much the, in, in the, the right place. I'm, it, there's gonna be some, some changes I need to make to the proportions, but overall I'm in the right spot. So that's kind of a good uh, confirmation that, uh, that it's all working for me, so. All right. I'm just going to keep working through here. This gets really organic in here. So I want to start to see if I can define some of these trees back in here. What are some of the marks that I'm looking at? Um, there are some kind of darker pine trees that stand out against, um, you know, some of these cottonwoods um, and other, other uh, deciduous trees back in here. And again, you can see that I'm not creating full marks. I'm just kind of creating these, um, these dots and dashes that are following along the paths of the, uh, of the edges of the trees here. I'm thinking about what that path is um, and then just dropping little bits and marks along that path rather than creating a solid line for that. into uh, this little line here that, that helps to create some depth along that plane there. Now, I'm gonna keep working on these trees, looking at the edges of these trees. There's a kind of an open spot in here that is kind of nice where these buildings start to stand out. And again, that's where paying attention to the, the um, varying my marks, so using more organic marks in the trees around it and then straighter, harsher lines to represent the buildings, uh, that can really help me to define the space. All right, moving down in the foreground, I've got this group of very subtle trees here. There's a bit of a ridge along here. Think about the structure of the landscape. So I've got, again, this fence line here. I'm kind of losing its placement, so I'm gonna take that out, try it again. I can site measure, I can compare the angle. Not worrying about the overall distance of that mark. If I overshot that line, I can always erase it back. Um, and then I've got this creek here that kind of falls alongside it. And it looks like we still don't, aren't able to get the live chat working. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, it looks like there's other, so I'm not seeing the chat here. So, um, so we have a question here, how to find the right angles of a painting. Uh, now you're looking, I'm assuming what you're um, referring to are the angles within, within the work here. So um, that's the tool that I just showed here. It's called angle sighting. So if you, if you have the subject, if your reference photo is in front of you, you can line, a, you line your pencil up with one of the marks in there. So say if I'm looking at this subtle angle of the fence line, I can line it up with that and I can physically carry it over onto my drawing. And then I can compare that to what I've got. And if you're working from life, if you're studying uh, the object in front of you, you do the same thing. You just close one eye. When you close one eye, it reduces your depth perception. Um, and it's like you're looking at a photograph then. And you can do the same thing. So you take your pencil, you line it up with the angle that you're trying to measure, then you carry it over. You try to lock your wrist, carry it over to your painting surface or your drawing surface, and you, uh, and you compare it against what you've got. Uh, the other thing too is, again, you try to set up your your subject and your drawing right next to one another and as you're focusing on your subject be really paying attention to the angle that your line your your hand is making as you're drawing uh, so if i'm again working on this line here i can have my hand my eyes fixed on the uh, that fence line and i can be letting my drawing hand kind of come in and uh, in alignment with that. So I'm using my peripheral vision to check what um, what that line is. So I'm just catching that motion of my hand to compare that against the angle that I'm looking at. So those are some of the, the tools that I use. Um, the other, another tool is that is the use of negative space. Uh, so the negative space again is the space around the object that you're looking at. So I can look at the shape of this this pasture here and see if that relates to um, the, 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 uh, the reference photo. Does that actually look correct? Um, and if not, then I can make those changes and I can kind of gather more information um, and use it to inform the next phase of my drawing. So those are some of the, the tools that I use there. I'm going to take some time here. Let's see. All right. Looking for, trying to get the live chat working, but I'm not able to see anything. So um, we'll keep at it. Um, move down, moving down to the foreground, I'm going to start to place some of these landmarks here. So I've got these foreground trees. Um, and here's where I really want to allow the marks to become more gestural. Uh, so what does that mean? You may have heard of gesture drawing before, uh, but really what a gesture drawing is, it's a light, quick, and loose drawing. There are these marks that are intended to be quick and loose that are referencing the basic structure of the object you're looking at. So it's not about capturing all the photographic detail of it. It's about um, reacting to what the object feels like and how it moves through the space. Uh, so in this case, you know, these trees here are really kind of jaggedy and, and I want my marks to have that same type of quality. Even if they're not 100% accurate, if they have that same type of quality, um, that's ultimately what the viewer is going to respond to and that's ultimately what I care about is I want marks that replicate the, the basic structure and the quality of the objects that I have in front of me. So with these trees, for example, you've got these trunks that are really, uh, really interesting looking, you know, all squirrely, and um, they contrast against some of the younger trees that are straight um, and have these long, kind of wispy, straight trunks and branches. Uh, and then that contrasts against the, the bushes here that are in the foreground, these kind of the scrub brush, um, that is, is also has a different texture. It fills the space in a different way. So I'm going to let my marks kind of reference that. Uh, I don't want hard, jagged marks to create this bush because that's not the way it feels. I want, um, I want the soft marks that suggest the, the material, the substance of these, these objects. So I'm going to move across here. And I'm going to place this other tree again. These are, again, more, more gestural in nature, thinking about how these branches curve, intertwine, 
you know, how, what is, how does it change from the base up to the end uh, at the tips of these branches? You know, some of these trees seem to have no rhyme or reason to the way they're structured. Others are, are much more kind of simple to understand, much more direct. And so, again, what kind of stands out for me is that contrast between these really kind of, and again, it's kind of squirrely marks and, and the other textures that are present in that uh, in this landscape. Uh, now along here we get what's called a compound curve. So there's overall there's this kind of slant to the landscape. There's a, a kind of a general slant to it. But when you break that down you get all of these curves that kind of interlock and they're they're going from concave to convex constantly interlocking to create that overall structure and we want our drawings to do that so rather than attack attack this in one straight line i'm going to break it up into sh a, a bunch of these shorter segments and really look at um, how they overlap and how they intertwine so here we have the hill that kind of that kind of tucks in behind into that ravine and then the front edge of that comes in on top of it. And that overlapping of the marks is going to help to reinforce that depth. Since I'm not using value, using that contrast between dark and light, I'm going to use my overlapping form to help suggest the depth. And now we get this tree up here. And what's nice is that I'm, as I'm following along, I'm looking at the distances between these kind of landmarks that I've got and they seem to be aligning with other landmarks as well. So I have my other telephone pole here, um, and that's right in line with that. That's in right in line with some of these darker trees up there. So I'm feeling like the proportions are working out pretty well for me. So we're kind of at the second pass of the drawing right now, and I'm gonna go back through again and refine it even farther. That's really what the drawing process is all about. Um, it, one of the things I like to do very first class in my drawing classes is I ask students to think about what they think of when they say the word draw. You know, of course, if we're in an art class, the first thing they're going to think about is about making marks on a page. It's about creating an image. It's using these tools like grabbing a crayon, grabbing a pencil, making marks, creating an image. That's definitely a drawing. Um, but we also use the word draw to, to reference a lot of other things. You know, we draw names out of a hat, for example, or draw water from a well. And so what I like to um, encourage students to do is, is think about drawing more in those terms. Um, we typically refer to drawing, um, you know, in, in non-art terms, we refer to drawing in ways that suggest that we're pulling something out of something else. Um, again, drawing names from a hat um, or drawing water from a well. Um, and I like to think of the drawing that we're making similarly. We are drawing the image. We're pulling that image out onto the paper. So if you think about that, that image is already there and we're allowing it to emerge. It's just not a clear image at first. So we're going to take a few missteps along the way. But as we kind of focus our attention on the whole process, um, that image will gradually emerge. If we want it to build from light to dark, or, you, know, um, you know, if we were draw starting with a black piece of paper, we, maybe we'd build it from dark to light. But either way, the image is gradually pulling up as a whole. We're not finishing one spot and then moving on. We are building the whole drawing up all at once. We're, we're pulling it all out of, um, out of our minds as we go. Um, now this pencil is getting a little dull right now. It's most times when I draw it doesn't really matter so I've got my but I've got my pencil sharpener here and I want these lines to be kind of more fine and controlled. So what I'm going to actually do now is kind of lift up with my kneaded eraser if you have kind of a rubber eraser you can kind of do the same thing, just kind of lightly kind of lift up the marks. And I love what that actually did there. It starts to create a sense of atmosphere. That really starts to push it back. And I might let that mountain edge, the edge along there, just stay as it is. Let some of those edges be lost and found. Because to me, it's, this drawing isn't about the specific nature of that 
that horizon line. It's about everything that's in this valley. So I can let those stay back there, and I'm going to keep bringing this drawing forward. Uh, so now I'm going to go back through. I'm going to add another layer of detail. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of hesitant to... I don't want to grind the, the tip of the pencil down too much, so I'm going to switch my grip a little bit. Um, and I would encourage you to experiment with a variety of grips because um, you want to be able to control your pencil um, no matter how it's being held. Um, I, I want the ability to kind of slide my pencil left and right and I like this kind of vertical orientation of it. And I'm letting these lines get pretty big and I'm starting to actually get into the, the realm of shading in here so I need to be careful with that. Um, hard, it's hard to tell what's going on in this area so I'm just going to let that be. That's really getting blasted by the light in the reference photo so there's not a whole lot of geographical information that I can rely on. There's nothing in the rocks that I can really draw at this point so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift here and I'm going to draw greater attention to this hillside. Um, and there we get some value contrast in the reference photo. I don't think I quite got that, that right here. I love the way these trees kind of dot the landscape. They give little points of interest that I can rely on to kind of orient myself. Moving down in that foreground, letting the top edges of these trees just get kind of softer. Again, letting the quality of the marks become something that we're really thinking about. I want these, I want these lines in these trees to be softer, more subtle, to contrast against uh, the buildings and even some of the, the kind of the spruce trees that we've got back in there. So there are quite a few little structures back in there. I'm not going to bother with those details at this point. If that's something that you've got time to work on, I want to get through this drawing a little bit more quickly for this down live kind of exercise here. Um, but you know, you're always welcome to kind of stay in an area and really focus on those details. One of the things you want to think about too is the structure of the landscape. Is it is it rolling? Is it a flat plane? Are you looking across it? Are you looking at it, you know, so for example, this pasture here, we're kind of shearing across the surface of it. We're not looking directly down at it. It's not a wall that we're looking at. It's an angled plane that's receding away from us. And you want to start to think about those things as I'm working up this ridge line here. I want to kind of define that edge. Now you can see that contrast and line weight letting those mountains just kind of disappear back there and bringing that darker line in on top. And when we get to the charcoal later, that's really going to pop. You know, actually, we'll probably leave these back here as they are. And we'll darken these foreground lines, and that's going to make a big difference in the overall sense of depth in the drawing. All right, so I'm kind of in these kind of bigger clusters of trees, letting these marks just kind of be softer. One of the things I also think about is if I, if I know I need a really fine point for certain areas, I'll kind of reserve those uh, areas. I'll kind of I'll be thinking about when, when I'm going to use those sharp marks and work my way up to them. So I'll either do them right away when my pencil is nice and sharp, or you can see what I'm doing here is I'm actually engaging the side of the pencil uh, to kind of create these trees that are a little bit softer anyways. And it's also at the same time, it's simultaneously sharpening the pencil. And then, then that tip becomes a little bit sharper now as a result. 
going to clean up that line a little bit. Uh, I'm going to move down in here. Draw this road that kind of comes in behind the silo. I'm going to enhance that road. It's pretty subtle in the photo, but I'm going to darken that line to make that stand out a little bit. Provide a little bit of structure here. Here, if I want a straight line, I can actually use my eraser. Now, in this case, a straight edge makes sense because I'm working with an organic, I mean, a, a, an inorganic object. I'm working with the structure of that silo. Um, and so hopefully that contrast between these kind of sharp edges that I just drew and the softer, more organic lines will actually create a stronger focal point right there in the center. Um, and if this center point becomes a focal point for me, I can do that as well. Um, and part of what makes that work is that these lines are relatively short in the overall drawing. If they were longer edges, like the edges of the road, I'm not sure as if I would do that. So let me just see how this works, see if I'm happy with it. Um, and because I have a lot of those kind of sketchy marks um, already established, that kind of softens those, those edges a little bit as well. Uh, let me see. Overshot that. So I'm curious what challenges you all might be making for yourselves um, as you're as you're working. What are you what are you doing in your artwork to try to make use of your time? Especially if you're if you're indoors now, this is a great opportunity to build your skills. Um, so I'm kind of curious what people are actually doing. Um, I'm setting challenges for myself. Like I said, in this case, I'm working with uh, these with a landscape, focusing really a lot on line as a way to build uh, my skills with line work. Again, to kind of focus my attention. Um, I work very differently than th this way than when I do uh, as a as a painter when I'm outdoors painting. I would um, not have this level of control and detail in my work. Um, so this is a nice kind of break from my typical way of working, and it's getting me to think about things in a new way. Uh, so I'd love it if uh, if you're able to share what you're doing. I don't know what what's your studio practice look like now. All right, before I get any farther down there, I want to get this area kind of locked in. Um, it, it's there's. Uh, a lot of there are a lot of trees up in here, so I want to think about what is really essential for me to indicate here. I want to think about that ground plane. I, it, it's really important to me that I understand what that perspective is here, and we have, this isn't necessarily a a lesson on perspective. Um, there's a lot that goes into it. Um, the when I, I have a course that I taught on, on perspective and it's all about kind of building an intuitive sense for perspective so that you don't have to rely on systems. You may have heard of one point perspective, two point perspective, etc. Um, and it can start to feel kind of formulaic at some point, and feel like it's almost like a science. Um, and I found it most effective to build an intuitive sense for it. And an, and an intuition as to uh, what is happening in the perspective of your drawing or your painting and be able to react to that. Um, and so that's really what I'm doing here. I'm using um, kind of some comparative um, angle sighting, reacting to, um, reacting to the structure of the landscape, the angles, the shapes that I'm seeing. And I'm not focused on finding vanishing points. So here in the field, I'm kind of creating some looser, more organic marks to suggest that change in um, coloring in that, uh, in that pasture there. You see these areas that have received more water, so they're a little bit darker. And I'm making some changes to the overall proportions here, working across into this grove of trees. And that's feeling a bit more correct as I go across. 
and I want to give a little bit more structure still here. I'm looking for something that I can really sink my teeth into. And what I want to do, I think with that, is kind of focus on some of these uh, trees. I think about rhythm a lot when I'm drawing as well. As the marks I'm making as I'm kind of skipping across the page, I'm, I'm tapping on the page with some sort of um, some awareness on kind of the overall rhythm, what happens as we kind of move across there. I have a tendency to make these two, mat, two dashes and a dot when I'm indicating an edge, and that's just something that I, I've fallen into, and it doesn't bother me, so I, I've kept it. So you might see that, this, this kind of thing, two quick dashes and a dot or something to help kind of break up an edge. Um, start to pay attention to what your marks are. Um, as you're reacting to uh, subjects, the objects in your, your drawing, is there a visual rhythm to your drawing process as well? And so what's interesting in this uh, in this example is that you know this line here, the road, it's a light line against kind of the darker areas around it. But because I'm not working with value, that becomes a dark line um, in the drawing. A little rise in the hill. Thinking about how we can break that line up into a combination of subtle curves. So again, taking multiple stabs. So now at this point, I've probably drawn this portion of the road you know, five, six, seven times. Never trust that it's right the first time. Um, all right, as I move forward, I am going to be thinking about this. Here. There's a hill, there's kind of a drop down. So I'm letting my marks now just kind of and reference that this is, this indicates that line that change in plane from going kind of at this angle here up the slope to the road and across the plane so I can just let my marks kind of reference that and go with the flow I'm not worried too much about it being precise because I'm not actually indicating objects here I'm just indicating structure this is the cross contour of the object these marks are moving across the the surface they're not the edges of the surface. So think about the, the cross contour. Can't really see the road very clearly here, so I'm not even gonna worry about that. There's these trees that kind of cover over it. So I'm just letting this whole area become more kind of ambiguous. Uh, you may tackle it differently. Um, coming back here, and I'm just gonna add a few more kind of hits of detail, something for the eye to rest on. Provide a little bit more structure so what the, what the eye is doing at this point actually is it's, it's making sense out of this abstraction. We've got these marks that are all kind of swirling across the page and our brains are perfectly primed to make sense of those marks. Um, and so we, we, um, we can't really fight that. We use that as, an art, as, as artists to our advantage. We understand how the brain interprets marks and then we use those marks to um, get the brain to think about things in a particular way. So I'm not drawing a tree here, I'm drawing marks. I'm making marks across the surface, but in such a way that the brain says, that's ah, a tree, I get that. And then in some ways it's hard to not see it as anything other than that. Okay, moving down to the foreground. Back to this again. Now we've done this a uh, few times now. I'm gonna add a little bit more detail. Uh, you can see that I've sharpened my pencil on both ends. This allows me to kind of switch back and forth. I don't have to stop and, and sharpen my pencil quite as much because uh, I can just switch to the, the other side of that. Uh, around the edges of the paper, I don't need this to be quite as detailed or precise. And so I'm going to kind of let some of these marks be kind of light and loose. Let's see if there's any other questions. No, not there, so. 
All right. Oh, here we go. I'm seeing them right now. So let me take a break here. See if there's other questions. Oh, people from all over India, Holland. Hi. That's awesome. Spain? Holy smokes. Excellent. So, again, let me know if you have any questions. I'll check back in a bit. Um, still going strong here. Uh, we're getting close to the end. Um, if you um, are looking for additional kind of resources, there's a lot out there online. Um, and uh, I would encourage that you, you kind of take the time to um, learn from people who are really kind of dedicated to teaching art. Um, learn from everybody. Um, I know at Artist Network, it, um, we really put a premium on um, not just techniques and skills, you know, which, we, which is something that we focus on, but also uh, really enjoying the process, the mindfulness of it, the healthful acts, aspects of, of making art. Um, so check out artistnetwork.com. Um, there's a uh, really nice, uh, great resources, Artist Network TV, all these videos that, that are available, um, and there's a, a deal going on there. Um, you can get everything for half off um, to help um, in, in these times as you're um, looking to build your skills. Um, and so check out those resources. Um, I'm going to keep drawing here. Um, I'm still kind of orienting myself, but I'm feeling like I'm getting close to a point where I can bring out the um, and bring out the charcoal. Now for an, an hour long drawing, I'm feeling pretty good about this. Uh, I would continue to refine this, but I think uh, for the purposes that I stated earlier, the idea that I'm kind of using this opportunity to slow my brain down, provide something to focus on, um, I'm, I'm achieving that, is forcing me to think about line weight, um, practice my drawing skills, looking at proportion and perspective. And so I'm feeling pretty good about it. Um, for me, I like to I, I like to think about uh, again the, the word drawing, um, and in that you can ask yourself uh, what's important to you. Is it drawing the act of drawing, or is it the drawing? Is it the object that you're creating? For me, I like to put more stock on the act of drawing. I like to think about drawing. I like to think about painting, not the painting. And then using the painting or the drawing as an indicator, as some sort of kind of signpost for our mind about how we were conceiving of uh, whatever subject we have in front of us. Um, what is the purpose for us making these marks? And for me, if I'm not enjoying making marks, making colors, controlling value, uh, then um, then it just becomes it becomes a chore for me. Other people, you know, I think do a great job, um, really kind of uh, prioritizing the the object itself. Um, and you see some great work come out of that. But for me, again, if if I haven't enjoyed the process, um, then I'm not going to necessarily enjoy the final result. This is a record of our time together. So every drawing you make is a record of that moment in time when uh, you were seated, you were focused, you were engaged in the subject and with your materials. Um, and to me, that becomes more valuable than the image itself. There's lots of images out there, but this is the only experience you're gonna have creating uh, the drawing in front of you. So um, just kind of think about that as you're, as you're working. How do you um, kind of internalize the process? What's important to you? And the more clarity you have on that, I think the, 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 the more you're going to enjoy the process. So I'm just kind of suggesting these tracks here. So you're gonna notice that I didn't create this S-curve across, um, across that hillscape. I kind of I followed that path, but I'm letting my marks actually run in a different direction. They're running contrary to that path, that S-curve. Um, for the most part, and that kind of softens it up, and that allows it to sit on that hillside. If I had gone like this, it would have it, it had the potential to pop it off of that surface. I, I want these to really kind of reference again the cross contour 
of the of the hillside there. I'm gonna soften some of these edges. Um, I'm gonna bring this this bush down in here. I don't need a whole lot. Just gonna suggest that again, thinking more about how that that object feels more over what it actually looks like. Because if I get my marks to kind of reflect the structure of those objects, then um, it's going to be more likely interpreted correctly by the viewer. Ah, so a question about um, uh, watercolor oil painting. Um, I, I tend to work uh, primarily in oil painting. Um, but all of these principles really kind of work uh, similarly. Um, when I do paint in watercolor pastel, um, I conceive of the process in a very similar way. These are all ideas that get translated into different mediums. There's nothing inherent in the mediums that changes the, the visual um, process, the, the visual laws essentially that we follow as visual artists. So. Um, I again, I, these are all ideas that I've, I follow with um, in, in other media as well. So it'll um, it'll translate nicely. I'm gonna switch this around. So now I have a, a sharp point. Again, I'm not focusing too much on getting every tree correct. I am thinking about the overall structure of that, so that you can see. Uh, just structurally, there's a, a big difference between this kind of jaggedy, it looks like a kind of a cottonwood. Hopefully I got that correct. And I'm going to use a different mark altogether, something that makes me feel like those branches. And then intentionally use that to contrast against these trees off to, to the left that are kind of wispier. They're thinner, more delicate. They fill the space in an interesting way. Um, feeling like this section over here is a little less defined, but that's all right. Just kind of reacting to the structure the marks that I see in there. Uh, gonna, ooh, I like this, this little fence post right in here. Drop that in there. Put in some of these doorways. So this is all in shadow. So if I was uh, working like I did on Monday, this would all be in shadow in there but I can indicate those doorways even though they're hard to see. And I'm gonna put this other fence post there. I feel like I need a little bit more structure in along here. Again, not a whole lot. I'm gonna leave that tree out actually. Um, and then what I wanna do is um, bring focus into this central area a bit more. Now I don't, I don't feel like I got this 100% uh, correct. That's all right. I feel like I've captured the overall essence of the scene in front of me. I've enjoyed taking the time to work with this subject having you all join in. Um, so I think that is it. You can see now I've got a bit more line variation, heavier, darker marks in the foreground, lighter marks receding into, uh, you know, almost disappearing towards that hillside. And I've created that atmospheric perspective that I was going for. Um, it felt really good to just kind of focus my mind on this for a bit. 
um, you know, as a finished work of art. I'm not sure if I'm there quite yet, but this was a, a fantastic exercise for me. I had, I had a lot of fun. So um, join me uh, on Friday. I'm going to be here at the same time working on another drawing. Um, I really feel the need to uh, kind of work on my perspective a bit. So um, I've got a, a really a fun subject, just a fairly simple street scene that is going to help me um, kind of dial that in. So I hope, uh, I hope you're going to join me uh, again, same time on Friday, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, check out artistnetwork.com. Um, check out Artist Network TV. Again, fantastic resources if you're looking to, to find videos that are going to help you um, improve your skills. So thank you, and I will see you at the next event.